So, how was the big wedding? Oh, yeah. didn't you hear? Yeah. So, it's at the end of night. Everyone's on the dance floor, really getting into oh, it, you know? Yeah, you and, say, this is my left wheel. Uh -huh. And this is the bride's foot. Yeah. Bush. How awful. Well, it wasn't all bad. I left with the best man's number. You no. are terrible. Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not inviting you to my wedding. That's it. You're off the list. All right, welcome to our first international guest on the Normalist podcast, Samantha Ranky, and the your little sidekick there, Lola. My sidekick. This is Lola. She's um she's moaning. I don't know what she wants. She's she's <laughs> already had food twice this morning, so it's the morning in the UK. Um, and I've already fed her twice, but now she's going. She's just crawling all over everything <laughs> at the moment. I, they're, they're two sphinx cats, so you know the naked cats. I don't know if any of your listeners like you know the the show Friends. Um, they it's such a shame because they get such a like a bad reputation, but they're the most loving and endearing like cats. Although my she she doesn't look like a normal sphinx cat, um, but my little boy Bruno he literally looks like a chicken, like a ball sack. <laughs> he looks like a, he looks like a scrotum. I don't know whether I can say scrotum <laughs> on this channel, but I just did. Um, so yeah, so they might they might come and say hello intermittently throughout today's <laughs> chat. Yeah, potentially a cameo from uh, little Bruno a bit later on. Yeah, absolutely. But it's great to have you, Samantha. Um, as you said, all the way from London, United Kingdom. Um, so over the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea over there. So it's about mid morning. <laughs> mid morning over yeah. there for me. It's eight o'clock. So late evening. Well, there you go. I know, and I. You would have thought that it's much, much earlier because I literally look like I've rolled out of bed. I promise I've been <laughs> up since 6 a.m. And this is the effort that I've made for you. Um, in my defense, I've got to go to a really nice uh, a, a book launch tonight of a fellow friend who is hearing impaired. Um, and so she's just um, brought a book out. So I've got to go to Trafalgar Square tonight. And, and I thought, you know what? I can't be bothered to put my makeup on twice in one day. So this is what you're getting. You're getting disheveled samantha you you think that people work in television are glamorous and i've proved you wrong so yeah, there well, we go I think people will jump people can jump on the uh, the normalist podcast youtube channel and um you can give samantha a bit of a rating for a, her outfit she says it's disheveled that's, I think it's that's cruel <laughs> color coordinated <laughs> That's cruel i think that will i think that would put me into a deep depression <laughs> Well, in, in all seriousness, though, Samantha, uh, a woman of, of many talents, to say the least, an actress, presenter, speaker, writer, and disability rights campaigner, um, you've appeared in various different TV commercials and TV shows for the BBC, ITV, and even Amazon Prime. But most importantly, and I think the way most people would remember you, is the, uh, the infamous Malteser commercial. <laughs> <laughs> So, did, you, did you get that? You you didn't get that where you were, did you? Surely well, not. I, I, as always, I do a bit of digging around before I get my guests <laughs> on just to do my research and make sure so, make sure that um got all my bases covered. But yeah, I was watch, watching that and I've actually done a bit of a screen recording. I'm going to include that in the intro oh, to no. clip on YouTube so everyone can... <laughs> everyone Thanks can, for can that. But that was really quite a laugh, wasn't it? It was really... Um, yeah, really well done, really absolutely. Absolutely. So I'll tell you a little bit how that came about. So um, I moved to London in 2012. I actually trained as a high school teacher, worked in a school um, for a couple of years, was a bit like, now nah, this is not this is not the life for me. Um, I often joke and I say, you know, I, I didn't like children. And that was the epiphany that I was like, I just don't want, like children. But no, it was absolutely con contrary to that. I I love the kids and they were so res respectful and I actually love being that role model. I love not only being a teacher, but also, you know, being able to show them a different viewpoint of disability. So I'm a full-time wheelchair user and I'm, I've got a petite stature. You know, I vis visibly I look very different, but to be quite honest with you, the kids were wonderful. Um, I just, it just wasn't right for me. I'm very much, as you just said, with all those accolades, I'm very much a person that gets bored quite easily. And I um I need to keep, you know, I need to keep dipping into lots of different projects. And I like to say yes to things. And I think the education system, although there is a little bit of flexibility and there is a little bit of spontaneity, you are still 
you are still in quite a, a rigid institution, you know, that doesn't really, that doesn't, doesn't always allow for creativity um, or as much as I like. So when I moved to London, um, I got, I fell into acting and the Maltesers advert, that was kind of my first big a acting role. So it's a really well-known chocolate, um, particularly over in the UK. Sorry, I've got a bit of fluff in Australia my eye. Too. Maltesers um, a lot over here as well. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and, and it's really funny because at the at the time there was there was a real drive, a real initiative to understand the importance of representation in media. And I was very much riding that wave. I was very much one of the one of the handful of disabled creatives that were really pushing that initiative, not only in front of the camera, but kind of um, you know, educating behind the camera. And a lot of people think that someone just grabbed me off the street and was like, hey, could you do this chocolate commercial? <laughs> and I was like, it didn't really work like that. I did have an agent. I did go for an audition. I did go for a second callback audition. You know, so I paid my dues. And why it was so groundbreaking and so um, inspiring for a lot of people and, and I suppose, like, game-changing was not only did we see, you know, protagonists, disabled female leads, um, being cheeky, sassy, talking about sex and relationship, talking about, you know, just being a normal human being. And these commercials, it was actually, um, it was actually a competition. It was a competition held by one of our main broadcasters, Channel Four, um, and it was up to it was to the lead the lead up to the uh, Para twenty sixteen. Um, so the Para twenty twelve, Paralympic twenty twelve, were really successful. Um, and that really put you know that was that was you know integral to changing the landscape of disability. So you know in twenty sixteen when they were when when they came to the UK. There was this real drive to get disability, you know, out there, not just for, you know, two weeks of the Paralympics. So the commercials, they actually played, they launched, so they like, um, they, they had their debut um, at the at the opening ceremonies of the 2016 Paralympic. I actually had like a little party at my flat in London. <laughs> I had a few friends over, you know, for a few drinks and it was it was groundbreaking because we'd never really seen anything like that before. And it's kind of a bittersweet, bittersweet story because for me, you know, as an actress, it was, you know, my first real big paid job, you know, like I was like, oh my God, they're going to pay me for what to eat chocolate. That's amazing. Um, and, and, you know, I, it obviously helped get a lot of my feet through many, many doors and people recognize me even now, like what? How many years later? I can't do math. 2016? Like, you know, seven how many years, years later? Seven years? Seven Is years. it already? Yeah, yeah. Jeez. Um, like, even, you know, that now people stop me. Um, and, like, particularly men in, like, vans. Oh, oh you're the girl from the Maltese or whatever. But, you know, at the time, people would, you know, really stop me and engage with me, you know, and kind of break down those those barriers of awkwardness around disability but also you know the bittersweet element was I don't think we've necessarily seen anything as groundbreaking since then which is a little bit sad you know of course representation is very much at the forefront of brands and you know um marketing which it should be but I feel like you know that that rawness and that kind of um that you know just not being scared of doing something so bold when where disability is concerned I don't feel like we've had much of that and also you know on a personal level I was um you know subject to horrific tro trolling you know after the commercial came out and that was kind of that was a alarming to me I suppose I was quite naive you know I like to think that I surround myself with people who are my cheerleaders people who you know obviously recognize I have a disability but don't really give a shit you know like it's you're, you're just Sam and you're great um and you know to open up my phone and have people say that I you know I'm not 
a real human, that I'm vile, that I make them. Someone even said, I make, I, I, they, the girl on the Maltese advert has put me off eating chocolate. I mean, for God's sake, like, you know, like, really, I don't think anything would put me off eating chocolate. Um, you know, but there was people telling me that I should kill myself and so on and so forth. And it was a really hard time for me. And it, you know, it, it had a very negative impact on my sense of self-worth and my confidence. And for quite some time, I let, let them win and I I you know I wouldn't accept other TV opportunities because I was so fearful that you know if I were to take them I didn't I really didn't want to open up my phone um and then after about I would say it was probably a good three months of just feeling really like a victim which in many respects I was but I really internalized it I kind of um you know, I got my shit together and I was like, look, no, I, you know, remember why you did this and remember how much fun you had and remember the reason why you moved to London and remember all the reasons why you, you know, you do what you do. And I I actually wrote about my experience in the Huffington Post and um and and kind of I I changed the narrative. And ironically, like that article in the Huffington Post sharing the abuse that I got it was so well received and that really perpetuated my career as an activist and a campaigner sorry I do talk a lot I do apologize oh it's great <laughs> I, 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 you're probably thinking let me get a word in a way no, let, no. let me have a question in 